Society Stress and Pain with Dr. Ralph C. Harvey. We at Fear Free would like to thank our friends at Zoetis for sponsoring this presentation and thank Dr. Harvey for being with us tonight. And I'd also like to thank each of you for being here with us tonight. Before we begin, I have a few brief announcements. Um, first, this presentation has been approved for one hour of race CE credit for veterinarians and veterinary technicians. At the end of the webinar, the screen will automatically take you to a web page where you can enter your contact information and answer three very brief questions. Your CE certificate will be sent to you. Um, I'm not sure exactly how long it will take, but it won't take long. Um, if by chance you're not forwarded automatically, I will also post the URL directly into the chat window so that you can um, capture it there. Speaking of the chat window, Dr. Harvey will take questions at the end of his presentation, so please feel free to enter them there uh, for consideration to be answered live. And um, one last thing, because we always get asked this, yes, this presentation will be available in an archived version on the Fear Free website within a few days. Um, the URL is really easy to remember. It's fearfreepets.com slash webinars. So, um, uh, I would like to introduce our speaker tonight. A member of the Fear Free Executive Council, Dr. Ralph Harvey is currently retired. He told me he's retired, but he's not good at, good at it yet. Is currently retired from teaching anesthesia and pain management in the Department of Small Animal Clinical Sciences at the University of Tennessee College of Veterinary Medicine in Knoxville. He previously served as the section head for the Small Animal Surgical Services and as a member of the University Faculty Senate. His veterinary degree is from UTCVM and his postgraduate training included internship, residency, and fellowship at Cornell's Veterinary and Medical Colleges. Dr. Harvey has also worked in private small animal practice, so he does understand what you face out there in the real world. He is certified as a specialist by the American College of Veterinary Anesthesia and Analgesia, 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 and has served as their executive secretary and as a member of the ACVAA Board of Directors. Please take it away, Dr. Harvey. Thanks very much, Christy. Thanks to each and every one of you for joining us tonight. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank our sponsor, Zoetis, for making this webinar possible. This follows a podcast that was presented recently in the Fear Free format um, and, and from the website by Dr. Tammy Grubb, a friend and colleague of mine, anesthesiologist and also a member of the Fear Free Executive Council, and Dr. Sharon Campbell, the medical director at, uh, with Zoetis. And they discussed um, really sedation, uh, I might say sedation without hesitation for many of our patients. And, and this is intended sort of as a case review, a series of cases to discuss with you some of the ways that we can apply the principles of fear-free management on our, our daily case basis and, and sometimes with the more challenging animals. So I'm going to make reference uh, time and again to uh, the podcast by Dr. Grubb and some other resources that are available uh, from the, the fear-free website. I'm trying to speak up so that you can hear me clearly. If you can't, please uh, let our moderators know and they'll pass that information along to me so that I can speak up so they can help you better. Please uh, share with us your wisdom, uh, the benefit of your talents as you're sharing your time tonight uh, with the, when it does come time for some questions and you can supply those and, and we'll discuss those once I finish my song and dance with these PowerPoint slides, if you will. I wish I could look out into the audience and see each one of you. But, you know, the other side of that, you have the benefit of not needing to see me. So it's probably a, a good thing from your perspective tonight. You can just listen to my words and see these nice images. So we're going to start off with a few questions to ask about uh, this topic, really. And, and I've posed them here. When does fear occur in a patient visit? And, and we're all familiar with the fear-free principles. I'm speaking to the choir a bit tonight. So we know that our patients are fearful when they come to us. Does that fear then lead directly to stress and anxiety? And of course it does. That's really a rhetorical question. I often speak on the spectrum of fear, anxiety, stress, and pain in our animals and how this fear-free movement initiative is a gentle revolution in our work to improve not only the success of our patients' outcome, but make it safer for them to reduce the real injury that occurs to them from fear, 
to reduce the real injury that occurs to us that comes from their fear and anxiety and stress and to improve the situation uh, and reduce, if you will, please, the injury that occurs to our practice and our clients when we engage in uh, the, the bad old days of trauma to our patients. So we know that fear is deleterious. Uh, we, we need to ask the question also rhetorically, is pain an emotional as well as a sensory event? compounded or exacerbated by fear, anxiety, and stress. And again, of course it is. Uh, pain is defined by the International Association for the Study of Pain as an emotional as well as a sensory experience associated with actual uh, or even potential tissue injury. So what can we do to improve our practice? Well, we can diminish that spectrum of fear, anxiety, stress, and pain in our patients. And it's, it's so helpful uh, as we go through our daily practice, and, and some of the cases I'm using tonight are a bit more challenging uh, patients that I've encountered, and I want to share with you just among the many ways we could do it, some of the tricks that we've applied in taking care of these patients. We often fall back on this graphic and this information from the Bayer Veterinary Care Usage Study that was published in 2011 and updated in 2014. And it does display for us the client's appreciation of stress that they feel in just thinking about coming to the veterinary hospital. 26% of dog owners and 37% of cat owners say it is stressful for them to even contemplate coming to see us in our veterinary practices. And that is in spite of the fact that our profession is among the most uh, highly respected and honored and admired professions um, of any that are out there. And so it does stress our clients to think about this. The client's perception of what their animal thinks is that 37% of those cat owners, excuse me, 37% of the dog owners and 58% of the cat owners think that their pet hates going to the veterinary office. I think it's higher, and I believe you might agree with me. I think the average dog has a perception that going to the veterinary hospital is about like a person with substantial dental phobia being forced to go to the dentist against their will. I think the average cat that's coming in to see us uh, maybe thinks they've been abducted by the aliens and taken aboard the mothership. So we know there are strategies that we can apply through the fear-free principles to diminish that stress to the patient, that stress to the client, uh, that fear that they all feel and the reluctance that they therefore have to being presented to the veterinary hospital. We know that substantial dental phobia interferes with the delivery of good dental care in people. And we can certainly understand that the stress and anxiety and fear of going to the veterinarian does interfere with the delivery of good veterinary care as well. We think about the anesthetic requirements for our patients, and, and of course, that's my perspective, having served as an anesthesiologist for all these years. So I, I kind of emphasize anesthesia and pain management and perioperative stress, and, and moving now toward more of the, the fear-free initiative. I've told many people that this fear-free work is the third one half of my career, having spent the first half becoming a competent anesthesiologist to take advantage of the subtle science and exact art of potions, if you will, to draw a line from J.K. Rowling. And, and the second half of my career really was the application of pain management. I spent more time uh, relieving pain and, and determining analgesic and pain management strategies for patients over the second half of my career than I have, strictly speaking, anesthesia, just keeping them sleepy. And really, if you get to enjoy your career and do this long enough, you get three one-halves to your career. And, and so the fear-free initiative is really the third one half of my career. So let's, let's look at these anesthetic requirements, if you will. The concept of balanced anesthesia and balanced analgesia plays right into the fear-free principles. And I'm going to use that analogy, if I can, to get us started. We have a four-phased model of anesthesia that includes pre-medication, induction, and maintenance and recovery. We have analgesic strategies that are based on a preemptive approach, a multimodal approach, and also a willingness to dose to effect, really to continue our analgesic strategy in the post-operative period. Anesthesia is certainly not just the delivery of drugs, but also it's perioperative support for our patients and monitoring 
so we know where they are. So monitoring their signs, using their vital signs, their instrumentation that we have to appreciate trends and using the instrumentation to really be able to talk with the animals the way maybe Dr. Doolittle did, the original Dr. Doolittle, to talk with the animals and ask them how they're doing and then use that monitoring equipment, the information we gain by monitoring our patients to understand what they're trying to tell us physiologically, if you will. So we combine sedation, muscle relaxation, unconsciousness, analgesia, uh, amnesia to, to come together in a balanced anesthetic uh, uh, plan, if you will. Let's look at those phases of, of anesthesia in more detail. The first phase is really the, the intake and the history and patient evaluation. So this may not be just a single episode. It may be the history we've accumulated through even many years of dealing with a specific patient. But, but we find some information about those animals. We get to know them, and we determine what makes them unique, what makes them different from the last patient that walked in the door, from the last patient that we took care of. What are their special needs? What really are the concerns we need to focus upon? What are the anesthetic concerns that we can identify that then lead to individualized care? What makes that patient unique? And I try to teach my students to do that in an efficient manner so that they don't take uh, 30 minutes to come up with a protocol for a patient. We need to move along in veterinary medicine and take care of this animal before it gets more stressed, if you will. So the second phase is really pre-anesthesia and pre-medication. This is perhaps not the first application of pharmaceuticals, uh, we've been applying the fear-free principle since we first uh, saw that animal, prepared to see that animal. We may have some pharmaceuticals that we've sent home with the client. So we'll talk about the pre-visit pharmaceuticals that we may send home with the owners to facilitate care. And that's increasingly recognized as a valuable part of our management and support and success, really, in taking care of the most challenging of our patients. We think pre-anesthesia and pre-medication is those few medications we give right before the induction of anesthesia, maybe 30 minutes, maybe an hour before. We really want the animal as calm and comfortable and pain-free and stress-free as possible from the time they approach the veterinary hospital, not just after we pull them from a cage or pull them from a carrier and start administering medications, but we want to use these pre-visit pharmaceuticals we're going to discuss as an opportunity to relieve the anxiety some anxiolytics, if you will, to make it easier for our patients. The use of the pheromones, things like feel away and adaptal, to reduce the stress. The fear-free principles of separating our waiting room so the cat that's presented does not have to tolerate the young beagle in the same room and in the same space, if you will, increasing its stress. All these things we do before we administer the pre-meds. But the pre-medication, the pre-anesthetic medication, falls right in line with that to continue the relief of that spectrum of fear, anxiety, stress, and pain. We always keep an eye on those principles of the Fear Free Initiative as we take care of our patient. And, and just pause and contemplate that, and it becomes a way of life, if you will, in that gentle revolution that we celebrate in the Fear Free Initiative. The induction of anesthesia is dramatic, isn't it? And as we take over the responsibility for a patient's airway, that can make us nervous, you know, even as a, a fairly experienced gas passer of all these years. I've administered anesthesia to many, many thousands of patients, but it should always concern us. We're never complacent about that big responsibility of taking over the responsibility for another patient's airway and another patient's uh, next breath, if you will. So the induction of anesthesia is a time when we really have to be ready for the physiologic support and the best medications for that animals and realize that changes can occur, surprises can happen. So we're prepared for complications. We're prepared for contingencies. If you will, we have a robust plan that's ready to take care of alternatives. Then we have the maintenance phase. If you draw an analogy to flying an airplane, this is kind of like cruising at altitude. We maintain physiologic stability, homeostasis, we are ready to handle any challenges, but we expect smooth sailing. That would be ideal. It does not always happen. The maintenance of anesthesia is accompanied by continued vigilance, and that's why vigilance is the motto of our physician counterparts who take care of anesthesia. That vigilance in spite of the potential for uh, uh, everything to be going well. You know, Sometimes we think everything's going well, and there might be some crisis just around the corner. So we remain vigilant. We remain on alert. The most dangerous phase of anesthesia is clearly during recovery from anesthesia. And in the American Animal Hospital 
Association guidelines for anesthesia of dogs and cats, that's clearly recognized that recovery is the most dangerous phase of anesthesia. If I can re recommend anything for each of us to do in terms of clinicians taking care of patients under anesthesia, the thing I'd recommend you do to improve anesthetic success, to reduce anesthetic morbidity and also mortality, is spend more time with the patients during recovery. That's uh, trained and dedicated personnel, a trusted member of your team who is serving as the anesthetist to keep an eye on that patient, provide physiologic support, maybe supplemental oxygen, maybe continued fluid therapy, maybe, maybe uh, continued monitoring also for that animal. And that continued support, that continued observation for a longer period of time than we might have applied in the past is associated with, with real uh, trend toward better and better success. Uh, so, so we look for the fear-free pre-medication pre strategies, if you will, and as we pre-medicate our animals and we relieve their anxiety, maybe that pre-visit pharmaceuticals also, both that and the pre-anesthetic medications lower the doses of induction drugs for anesthesia, the potentially most dangerous drugs we give, also lowers the dose requirements for the maintenance of anesthesia. We know surgery is going to provide some pain, so we start off with some analgesics and some preemptive approach to pain management. We're using a balanced approach. Currently in the era that we are experiencing shortages of opioids, we rely on opioids as we can, of course, but we also achieve some strong contribution to surgical pain management through the generous use of local anesthetics, through the use of uh, ketamine somewhere in our, pro in our protocol, through the use of the alpha-2 agonists like dexmedetomidine or dexdomator. All these things help provide analgesia for our patients, and we just want to start that early, continue it through the surgical experience, continue it in the post-operative period. These things contribute to decreasing the patient's stress, and that decreases our stress as, as providers of that care. Now, recognize that pre-medication strategy, some pre-meds are contraindicated in some compromised patients. So the key to success, regardless of what we do in medicine, the key to success is patient selection. So we recognize what's wrong with this patient, what might be the best protocol for it, is there anything in this patient that would preclude the use maybe of our favorites? Do we need to do something a little bit different because of this patient's risk factors, whatever they may be? Let's look at analgesic strategies because it's a good metaphor for the fear-free approach. This is a graphic that you've seen many times. I've highlighted the pheromones here because we've already talked about feel away and adaptal as valuable parts of our uh, reduction of the anxiety and stress for our patients. Just a, a gentle approach. It's not that that's going to solve all of our problems, but it is something that can make it easier for us to move forward and make a contribution. So it just increases the chance of success. It stacks the deck, if you will. And then we use other strategies as well. In this list of analgesic approaches, we see the graphic up in the corner there of the dog with various sites at which no susception or the pain process gets started and then is then it's subject to transmission to the spinal cord and then modulation in the spinal cord and brainstem. And finally, the nociceptive process, that pain process is finally converted into pain in the cerebral cortex. Well, I've chosen to put this slide here in this presentation because this list of multimodal approaches to analgesics is very characteristic of the multimodal approach, if you will, toward the, the management of fear and anxiety and stress, as we see in this next graphic. Here we have the combination of pharmacologic and also non-pharmacologic approaches. I always want to give recognition and thanks and appreciation to the uh, groundbreaking contributions of Dr. Temple Grandin and Dr. Sophia Yin. Uh, some people have said that they are fear-free before fear-free was cool. And I had the opportunity to speak extensively with Sophia Yin when we still had her available with us. And I've spoken extensively with Dr. Temple Grandin, who's a member of our Fear Free Advisory Council and contributes wonderfully to our, our program. So they, they have suggested particularly noteworthy contributions that are not based on pharmaceuticals, but are based on handling strategies, like separate areas for cats, maybe even feline-only facilities if, if available, if that fits for you. Certainly the pheromones we mentioned, the towel wrapping techniques that were popularized by Dr. Sophia Yin and are still available and promoted 
through the Cattle Dog uh, Publishing Company, and also uh, Dr. Yin's uh, towel wrapping techniques are still available on YouTube as well. In the old days, we might reach into a cat carrier to pull out a cat, and if that's an angry cat, like some of those we'll be talking about tonight, we might pull out a bloody stump, you know? The cat may be biting us and scratching us as we reach inside. Now, of course, the more contemporary approach is to separate that cat carrier. And fortunately, many of them don't have those corroded screws anymore that have clips or latches that will come apart. So we can open that clamshell and the cat can remain in its carrier. And in the meantime, we've placed a towel over the top of that cat carrier that had previously been sprayed by feel away, allowing plenty of time for the alcohol to evaporate because the alcohol is quite aversive. So that, that pheromone that's residue that's on that towel helps calm that cat. And we're explaining this to the owners, of course, telling them what we're doing and why we're doing it so they'll appreciate what we're doing. Perhaps we've sent home with that owner a, a, a foil package of a feel away towelette and they can wipe that around the inside of their, their cat carrier. Perhaps they've placed their carrier out in their room, you know, uh, several days in advance of the visit to the veterinarian so the cat is adapted to that carrier or even the dog in my own household the the cat carriers those mobile kennels they fit in quite well with the feng shui in our house and it's part of our landscape if you will and indeed when i need to bring an animal into the veterinary hospital i usually have to chase one out because they're just sitting in there taking advantage of their own special space so we try to use the that cat carrier as it's a familiar area of patient. We'll open that clamshell, try to calm it down. We minimize the rougher techniques we used in the past. Minimize scruffing. It, it results in pain and does not really elicit a good submissive response. We certainly need to avoid excessive stretching of our patients. Gentle technique really less is more. We know from the AHA pain management guidelines that excessive stretching is very painful for our cats. And osteoarthritis is common in all old cats. So when I was learning veterinary medicine, they taught me as a student, as a student, they taught me if I were working with a horse to work with that horse in a way that's comfortable for it, and my life would be better and perhaps even longer. That certainly applies to working with cats and dogs as well. You know, if we if things get out of hand, this is this is what we're going to be faced with is working with patients like this, and this is a cartoon representing those bad old days of uh, wrestling with animals. And, and fortunately, I'm, I'm not showing you images of, of uh, photographs, which you know I could, of people trying to do this and, and our colleagues perhaps being bitten and scratched and traumatized. And these are very serious injuries and can be career threatening and, and uh, really very serious injuries. We've all seen those. We need to avoid them. It, uh, that's sort of the heart of this, this message, if you will, as I discuss with you the the techniques that are applied in some of these more difficult patients. Now, if, if we had an animal coming in and it's difficult to work with like the dog that's shown in this cartoon, wouldn't it be wonderful if they all came in with a basket muzzle attached? And some of our clients tell us, oh, I can't get the basket muzzle on my dog. He won't tolerate it. But wouldn't it be wonderful if the first that dog ever saw a basket muzzle, it had something nice inside it like peanut butter or spray cheese? that basket muzzle suddenly would become that dog's favorite toy. And in fact, they'd probably bring it to their owner in order to get a snack. So indeed, the easy cheese or equivalents or peanut butter on the inside of that constitutes a modern medical miracle, if you will. And it trains the dog who's never seen a basket muzzle before that this is a good thing. Now, one of my residents has further modified these basket muzzles and she's shown here where she's uh, carved out a small area in the front of those basket muzzles. And you'll see an endotracheal tube coming out that basket muzzle. So we can indeed recover patients from anesthesia with their basket muzzle already attached. And that precludes or prevents us from needing to apply a basket muzzle to an animal that's starting to wake up. That's a frightening time. That animal may arouse from its residual sedation and be chewing on us at the same time we're trying to apply a muzzle. So what my resident has done is to modify this basket muzzle so that it allows us to place this muzzle on the dog before it wakes up from anesthesia. We still have the endotracheal tube present in the dog. We can be providing um, uh, oxygen through a breathing circuit or have a mask in front of that. And then when the animal starts to swallow, we can remove that endotracheal tube 
without ever removing the basket muzzle. Now, sure, you might be able to nibble a little bit, but this provides a great deal of safety for us. We're talking about some of the more difficult animals, and we need to recognize that we're not always going to have that muzzle on. So what do we do for a patient that comes in and, and is uh, more of a direct threat to us, if you will? So if you will, the bottom line on this cartoon, what now? This animal's trying to shred us, and, and we like to prevent it. Uh, uh, the multiple P's there, prior planning, you know, pre prevents poor performance, if you will. So we need informed consent and training for our owners so they appreciate what we're doing, those basket muzzles. We need experience in our personnel. One of the fundamental principles in taking care of animals that are really stressed, really excited, really fearful is in-home anxiolysis and sedation. The administration of medications, if you will, to help relieve their anxiety, to prevent produce some sedation before they ever arrive in the veterinary hospital. And, and I work closely with our behaviorist uh, in, in my own teaching hospital to manage these most challenging, these most fearsome animals as they present. We will use pheromones for what they're worth. We'll use trazodone quite often in dogs, cabapentin in high doses quite often in cats. We really like to have that basket muzzle in place and we work with clients work with our, uh, with our animal behaviors and animal trainers to, to transition an animal from being afraid of that muzzle to where they will tolerate it because that adds so much safety for our personnel. Our, our animal behavioralist tells us it's just a fundamental when these very aggressive animals or very, very fearful animals coming into our hospital that they have a muzzle in place. We want to avoid triggering their fear. We want to avoid bringing those animals into the waiting room. Uh, it would be one of the worst places to bring them. There are many options that we want to explore with you. We'll talk with you in taking care of a, a hound mix that was particularly challenging. How we provide sedation before we, uh, as we bring the animal in so they never encounter that waiting room and that chance for, for triggers to occur. Uh, heavy sedation, if you will, to, to complement our anesthesia to prepare that animal. We like to use oral anxiolytics, oral sedatives, rather than approaching these animals first with a needle, if at all possible. The alpha-2 agonist dexmedetomidine or dextomator is very valuable in this regard. We're going to talk about a walk and inject technique with telazole, a combination of taletamine and zolazepam, as a powerful restraint and, and anesthetic combination for these dogs to get us started in substantial uh, immobility, substantial uh, approach to general anesthesia in these animals. We want to maintain the, uh, the possibility of a smooth recovery that can be challenging because these animals were terrified as they come in. We want to send them home in a sedated, uh, at least anxiolytic fashion with instructions for the owners. And my, my usual comment is that we don't want to let those animals drive or uh, sign legally binding documents or, or operate heavy machinery. And our clients might think that's funny because they've heard that before, no driving, no heavy machinery, no legally binding documents. And then we'll get serious and discuss how that legally binding document is the contract we have with our animals that, yes, you may live in my cave, but you may not bite my children. As an animal recovers from the stresses of anesthesia and sedation and surgical procedures and being in the hospital, they could arouse, and animals that are fearful could arouse and bite the wrong person. Uh, maybe their judgment is clouded by the residual sedation just as it would be in a person. So now they'll tell us as patients, if we go into an outpatient center for surgery, as human patients, they'll tell us no driving, no heavy machinery, no legally binding documents for 24 hours. And these days they'll also tell us, do not send a text message having to do anything with your work. People have been fired over that. I'll have to tell you, dogs and cats have probably been euthanized because they made an error judgment as they recovered from anesthesia and sedation, and they may have bitten someone. So we have to talk with the owners, and that's part of the instructions. Allow them to sleep it off in a calm, protected area. That buys safety for that animal. That buys safety for all the personnel involved. Let's walk specifically through a technique here. We're starting with telazole as one of our anesthetics. It's a very powerful combination of taletamine and zolazepam. I'll say we're starting with it as an anesthetic. It's the first anesthetic that we're giving, that mixture, but we've previously administered some anxiolytics of some type for these patients. 
some typically in the dog it's a trazodone and my favorite dose is around five milligrams per kilogram and i'd like to give that in in a pill pocket or a small amount of food or something tasty for the animal the night before they're coming into the veterinary hospital and so that the so that the animal will express and show the signs of that anxiolysis and if it'll show any signs of sedation the owners can see that and can appreciate it and then the next morning the client will have another dose to give that animal again in a small amount of food in a pill pocket however is necessary to get it in the animal that anxiolytic dose of trazodone and many veterinarians are also using in dogs the gabapentin in high doses and certainly gabapentin high doses in cats at typically 100 milligram a uh, capsule for the cat or 200 milligrams for the cat. And that dose works out to be about uh, 20 to 40 micrograms per kilogram of gabapentin in the cats. That's truly a remarkably high dose. Um, considerable safety. Lots of experience in veterinary medicine giving that uh, to, to cats. And now increasingly veterinarians are doing that to dogs and trying it sometimes in combination with the trazodone to relieve their anxiety. And then if we need to, and if we can, if we have the option, an oral sedative of some type to give to the animal as they're perhaps in the car if necessary. Uh, we like to have the animal sedate as necessary before they come into the hospital. But this telazole injection is a powerful option. It's a top choice in our hospital for the aggressive or frightened animal. Um, we want to prevent conflict with those animals. We, it can provide remarkable physiologic stability. There's certainly, as with all anesthetics, there is respiratory depression. The recovery, substantial recovery occurs within about two hours, but it often has a delayed change in their uh, attitude and level of consciousness. So full recovery, again, don't trust that animal. Don't use it for work, if you will, it's a service animal, for 24 hours. So as they tell human patients, no driving, no heavy machinery, no legally binding contracts for 24 hours. Most people disfavor telazole in cats because of the rougher recovery. We generally avoid using higher doses of telazole in patients with respiratory compromise, certainly in cats that have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, just as we would avoid ketamine. If patients have seizure history, increased intraocular intracranial pressure, we may also be avoiding the uh, telazole in those patients. Uh, by means of more information on telazole, I have the important safety information. These important safety information or ISI slides are presented and they're here for your review also to tell us and inform us how the industry is really standing behind us. They have developed these pharmaceuticals for our best use in patients and they specific guidelines for labeled application. And, and many of these applications I'm discussing with you today are truly extra label. So I'm, in, I'm required to inform you that it's extra label to, to then warn you uh, to then tell you how we would use them and then inform you again that it's extra label. So please uh, pay attention to the important safety information that's on the drug insert. Read that material. It's there for your information. And then you can also see the full prescribing information at the website that's listed there. I want to jump in now to a case example where we use this particular combination of pharmaceuticals and behavioral approaches. This is Boone. Boone is a very interesting and challenging patient that we're still seeing at the veterinary hospital. A hound mix, six years old, male castrated dog. He's a, a seizure alert dog. He warns his owner um, when she is going to have a seizure. So this client has a profound seizure disorder herself and Boone warns her by pushing her toward a chair and he's taken care of her on multiple occasions. But over the last few weeks to a couple of months perhaps, um, He's developed some very inappropriate aggression toward his owner, toward this woman who relies on Boone as a, as a service dog. Uh, he's always been anxious around the veterinarian. He's got a history of barrel rolling when he's brought into the veterinary hospital. Recently, he has some other issues that increase his anxiety. He has atopic dermatitis. He has an injury to his hind paw. He has the potential, at least, for some chronic pain here. And the owner says she cannot place a muzzle on Boone. I don't know if she could before uh, or not. He's currently receiving combination of paroxetine, paroxetine and carbamazine for anxiety. He's also receiving some carprofen or Rimadyl for his pain and his limping. So he's got some underlying serious anxiety, some underlying pain states, and those contribute to his spectrum 
of fear, anxiety, and stress. And now it's time for us to take care of him just for his routine health maintenance, besides the fact that he has this inappropriate aggression directed toward his owner who is relying on him to take care of her. This is a challenging case. We need to not only take care of his vaccinations, draw some blood, we need to perhaps do some imaging, we need to do a good physical exam. There's a laundry list of things we need to do for Boone, and he is not an easy patient. So we develop a plan for him. We want some procedural sedation to examine him and stage the treatments, and that success really does begin at home. We're going to provide the anxiolytic doses, his usual anti-anxiety medications. Add to that some trazodone. We always warn, worry about combined toxicity with medications. So we do it with careful consultation. consultation. And, and we sedate him before he leaves the house, really. We want to relieve his anxiety. We do not certainly want to bring this animal in through our waiting room. We want to bring him in through another part of our hospital. We have a large animal hospital also. We brought him in through the barn. So he's distracted by the large animal smells and, and sounds, and he's not coming in where there are other dogs. I have a technique we call the walking hand injection. So I'm going to walk right along with the person who's leading the boon, and if possible, someone other than his owner, and if possible, with the muzzle on. But we, we have a, a, a lead on him that's a secure one. I'm going to walk in line with the person who's leading Boone with my hand on their shoulder. I'm not on the opposite side of the dog. I want Boone to have a route to escape away from both of us. I have a syringe that can, contains a combination of telozole plus butorphanol plus dextomator in the doses I've listed here. And as we lock, walk along, that lure lock syringe is loaded and ready to fire with a large gauge needle, probably an 18 gauge needle. So I can walk along and tap the person in front of me on their shoulder just when I'm about to make my injection. I'm not going to pause and aspirate to make sure it's not in a vein. I just want to make an in-dog injection. As I pause and make that injection very quickly, I'm going to step away. And he knows something's happened to him, but he has an escape route. We'll continue to walk him and, and walk him for a few minutes and then perhaps put him in, uh, in a carrier, if we have a carrier for him, a large crate, uh, put him in a secure area. I don't want him running loose. If, if, you, have, uh, if you have outdoor runs for the animal, we can, we can use those, but we don't want to bring him into our waiting rooms if possible. We want to provide a controlled environment for him. Be efficient, plan it out, have people who are comfortable working together and maintain safety for everyone. And we're going to discuss all of this with the owner in advance. So everyone's in on that developed plan. And we plan to send him home uh, sedated, if you will, with informed consent. And actually, this all worked very well for Boone. We actually found out that he had, uh, in addition to his pre-existing problems, he had intervertebral disc disease. We were afraid he had a brain tumor but we were able to take him to surgery and, and return him to much better function. But he's always going to be an anxious dog. Let's move on to talk about some cats. Wait, now. Dr. Harvey, um, we did have a question, a point of clarification on, on that. Uh, oh, someone wanted to know, uh, said uh, that she assumes this is uh, an IM injection. She oh, says apaxial is, IM injection. This is uh, IM injection in the apaxials. Uh, it's really an in-dog injection. You know, I'm not going to... Uh, aspirate to make sure I'm not in a vessel. I'm using a combination of medications that's powerful and yet has a wonderful uh, margin of safety, if you will. And that safety in includes the maintenance of cutaneous integrity for our personnel, which is right up there in our list of anesthetic concerns. But uh, we, we will make an injection that is hopefully an IM injection, certainly for Boone. That's our intent. That's great. And she, um, well, actually, someone else asked, uh, if, do you have a video of this? Oh, I don't yet have a video. I'll try to work on that for you. That Getting would be a video great. Let us know. would be powerful, but our first yes. priority is to take care of this animal. So, of um, course. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll work on getting one of those. I think it's going to be useful. Uh, when, great. When thank you happens. so much. Thank, thank you. Moving on to cats now. Thanks again for, for breaking in with that. It makes it more conversational and useful for everyone. Um, so I love this picture of this animal. This cat and his ancestors worked on this facial expression for several thousand years to intimidate potential aggressors. And folks, that's you and me. Uh, we know that this animal is already stressed. He's fearful. Uh, excessive manual restraint is going to make it worse for everyone involved. And struggling is going to uh, result in an increase in blood sugar, lactate, and catecholamine levels, and norepinephrine levels. And he may injure himself or he may injure us. Overall, it's a bad experience for everyone. Now, what if he's not a healthy cat? 
what if he's one of the 15 to 16 percent of cats that have undiagnosed cardiomyopathy? What if he's one of the many cats that has undiagnosed heartworm disease? We certainly wouldn't want to put that animal in an induction chamber, and we wouldn't want to stress him with manual restraint without any pharmaceuticals. So we'd like to reduce that stress, and one of the ways we'll do that is the administration of drugs like the high-dose gabapentin I mentioned earlier for these cats. It's the use of the Fearmone, the feel away, at home and also in the hospital. I spray feel away on one sleeve and adaptal on the other. And, and, and I don't expect that to solve the problem in these uh, potentially uh, very fearful cats like the one shown here, but I want to take the edge off. I want to gain whatever I bet I can, and then I'll use those other strategies of opening that clamshell chamber, dropping a towel on top of him. Perhaps if I can't open that chamber, I may spray some sedative medications in the, in the animal's mouth as it's hitting, hissing at me. I may put a handful of towels, if you will, or a cage pad into the airline carrier that the animal's brought in to make a gentle squeeze cage, and then I can inject him from outside the cage. Use those strategies rather than manual restraint with our hands on the animal, and, and then pull some of those towels out. Give that animal a chance for the drugs to take effect. We know that reducing the stress by getting medications in quickly can be benefited, reducing the stress by the previous administration of gabapentin, by the previous use of feel away, by applications of the fear-free uh, principles of good handling techniques, as well as the pharmaceuticals. Use the towel te wrap techniques as we can as well. We know there's benefit to reducing stress for all of our patients, and specifically for the critically ill patient, that maladaptive neuroendocrine response of increased catecholamines, lactate, blood sugar, it interferes with wound healing, is immunosuppressive, uh, uh, increases the heart rate and stress level and myocardial oxygen consumption for all of our stressed patients. So the fragile or brittle patient, that tender animal that, that can't stand the stress, they're gonna be particularly subject to fear, anxiety, and stress and deleterious results of those in the veterinary hospital. So we want stress reduction for all of our patients. The benefits of re relieving that stress and pain are the reduction of that sympathetic stimulation, improved eating and drinking, improved well-being, reductions in morbidity and mortality, and a more normal routine, return to routine and, and normal function for animals as we relieve pain for our animals. Uh, to give you some case examples, let me give you in particular an example we had here in, in my own hospital, uh, starting uh, this case in November, um, almost two years ago, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park had a terrible wildfire. This image is taken from the Alaska Fire Service, and I've selected it just because it has some wildlife standing in this river. We had similar fires in our Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And the residual effect on that was not only in the park, but also in the adjoining town and the adjoining communities. So many uh, homes were damaged, uh, uh, many buildings, uh, people were without their homes, many animals died, but we had some that survived. And this is one of those case examples. This is an animal that came to us as a good Sam case. We didn't know who the owner was at first. It took quite a number of days to identify her, and she was so happy that we had our cat. His name is Topper. And he had severe burns, uh, moderate pulmonary damage. He was a lucky cat to have survived at all. One of the medications we used in him to relieve that spectrum of fear, anxiety, stress, and pain is the long-lasting analgesic Cymbidol. We provide 24 hours of analgesia in this cat as a component of our pain management strategies. And Cymbidol is a concentrated buprenorphine. We have a ceiling effect, if you will, on its analgesic and sedative effect that protects our patients, but it's a pretty high ceiling effect. This represents buprenorphine. This is butorphanol, which doesn't provide a good level of efficacy, but the buprenorphine in Cymbidol provides a good level of efficacy with relieving pain. And this is one of the things we did to take care of Topper through the many days that he was a patient in our hospital. You'll see him a little bit later here where he's sitting up, he's had some initial wound care. He has some IV catheters. Uh, he's been treated for the variety of injuries and he's starting to make some some recovery here. Some of the fundamentals we have, not only the Cimidol as a foundational element for pain management, but also some ketamine in low doses. Some NSAID also, uh, Robina Coxib in this case. 
feel a way to reduce the stress. Lots of tender, loving care and nutritional support for this cat as he recovers from inj his injuries. He did make remarkable progress, and here he's looking much better. I want you to, to notice his, uh, his posture, if you will, his facial expression and posture. And of course, uh, part of that tender, loving care is to get the, the beautiful little bandages on his legs as he's healing his, his, his uh, injured feet there. But note his facial expression. Note the body posture. It looks more normal. His facial expression is something that we look for in cats that are comfortable. The ears are coming forward. The whiskers are up. The eyes look fairly normal. And his eyes are starting to look more normal in spite of his burns to his eyelids, if you will. Quite a bit later in this time, we, uh, we uh, were able to reunite him with his owner. And this is, this is a, an image right as he was uh, just about to, to go home with his owner. But you notice <laughs> this facial expression. Topper didn't like the attention so much. And here he's showing a facial expression we would ordinarily associate with an animal that's not so happy and also an animal that might be in pain. The ears are back and down. The whiskers are back and down. He's in a more crouched position. I have a picture of him sitting at home later on with his uh, favorite buddy. Now, the reason he's not happy in this picture, in this picture is, is evident because of all the caregivers around him along with his owner right there. So that's, this is a good time for me to say uh, happy Veterinary Technicians Week to all of our much admired and respected colleagues in the veterinary technician community. I know a lot of you are with us tonight and I thank you so much for being here and for your fundamental role in relieving anxiety, fear, stress, and pain in our animals. Uh, noise phobia is a profound source of uh, anxiety and fear, if you will, in dogs. It's estimated at least a third of the dogs in the United States suffer from noise aversion. It's probably the same in any community. I know we have people from around the world joining us in the webinar tonight. So we know that in, in our own country, at least a third of the dogs suffer from significant noise aversion, what we often call noise phobia. And, and it gets worse over time. It's even socially transmissible to other dogs in the household. It usually gets worse until animals finally start losing their hearing. And that leads to considerable distress and suffering. My wife is a shelter veterinarian. We know that in, that in the United States, July 5th is the leading date for animals to present to animal shelters. And that's because of the July 4th fireworks, if you will. They either escape from home or they're presented because their owners can't handle it anymore. Many medications have been tried, many strategies. We finally have a, a medication that really works well as an anxiolytic for noise aversion, and that is Cilio. It's a low-dose dexmedetomidine in a sticky gel that sticks inside the buccal pouch on the dog. Comes in a syringe that's uh, um, metered out in little dots or little clicks on this syringe, and the dose is quite small, and with the bioavailability we have with oral transmucosal dexmedetomidine, this results in what is intended to be and is often a sub-sedative dose. That low dose provides a relief of anxiety, works remarkably to turn around noise aversion for fireworks or for other causes of noise aversion in dogs. So it's really a game changer and uh, has, has been remarkably effective, a, a fairly new product. Again, we have the safety information for Cilio, um, uh, safety information with same as often with dexmedetomidine. But read that information. And again, this is how industry has prepared this medication and how they stand behind us in preparing these best medications for us. One of the final topics I want to have share with you tonight is sedation to manage animals that are delirious during recovery or agitated during recovery from anesthesia. As we, as we have new techniques available for outpatient anesthesia, we're able to wake up patients more quickly and more completely. Outpatient in human medication, outpatient anesthesia has revolutionized patient care. We expect to have procedures done and be able to go home often the same day. And the same thing now is possible in much of veterinary medicine. But as we have rapid recovery from anesthesia, and now it's possible, sometimes animals wake up a little too quickly. And postoperative delirium or agitation has become an increasingly important topic and an increasingly important concern. I want you to take a look at these dogs in the next image. I love sled, sled dogs. These are this a team of racing sled dogs, and they're so happy in their work. Look at their facial expressions. If you saw their feet, they'd be just flying over the snow, and they'll dig a hole in the ground and sleep and get up in the morning and do the same thing again in exchange for a little piece of horse meat, if you will, or probably a better diet than that for the racing sled dogs. 
But if you take any one of these animals out of the harness and you bring it into your hospital and put a 22 gauge needle into them, they think their world's coming to an end. You know, so these are purpose bred animals. As they wake up, they want to return to function. As they wake up, the sense of hearing is the first to come back of all the senses, the last to go away with anesthesia, the first to come back. They have some cognitive function before they can get up in a coordinated fashion. This animal here, this border collie, is sitting up here looking out over these sheep. It's a nice pastoral view from Ireland. This picture was taken by one of my students. It looks so peaceful. It is anything but peaceful. This is a highly stressed relationship between these dogs and these sheep. The dog's worried about them. They're worried about the dog. They both have important jobs to do. These purpose-bred animals, they also don't wake up under anesthesia very smoothly. So they often need some anxiolysis before they return to function. We have learned lessons from taking care of horses as they recover from anesthesia. Often a small dose of xylazine has improved the transition from inhalant to anesthesia to standing recovery. So these animals don't stand up too quickly. Similarly in dogs, small doses of dexmedetomidine, small doses of dextomator. This is extra label. It's only one half to one microgram per kilogram by intravenous injection is useful to reduce the agitation and delirium in dogs waking up from anesthesia. And parenthetically often in humans, the trade name product is Presidex in humans, but parenthetically it's the same low dose for humans. So if you, if you administer this small tiny dose IV to dogs who are gonna have a rough recovery, or preemptively to those who had a rough induction, you can preclude that rough recovery and smooth their recovery much better than what we used to use as acepromazine, much, much better than perhaps low doses of propofol or other uh, options. We have many uh, options to keep our patients happy at work. And these are those sled dogs just flying along the surface. What we wanna do is avoid the potential for conflict, reduce fear, pain and stress in our animals. Tremendous benefits to be gained by reducing a spectrum of fear, anxiety, stress, and suffering as we prepare patients for anesthesia. Continue our, our pre-visit pharmaceuticals that Dr. Grubb and Dr. Campbell emphasized in their podcast, a use of anxiolytics. Follow them with pre-anesthetic medications to continue. Use those fear-free principles, not only of pharmaceuticals, but also gentle handling. We want to extend the health span, increase the chance for success, and reinforce the human-animal bond with our patients. I have a variety of references that I have collected for you and can make them available. They'll be available on the recording as well. And I want to turn it over now to our moderator to see if we have any further points for discussion and questions before we run out of time. I thank you for your patience as I've gone through very quickly all these topics and let's see what we can talk about of interest to everyone. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Harvey. We do have a number of questions and some of them are closely related. Um, we have people attending from other countries who cannot access some of the medications you have uh, mentioned. We've also had people discussing uh, variable results. For example, tra trazodone is wonderful when it works, but it doesn't always work. And what else do you use? So I think that um, there's a great interest in the audience to hear about alternatives to some of the medications to uh, uh, trazodone, to telazole, to um, cilio that can't be obtained outside of the U.S. Yes, yes, thank you. And, and thanks to each of you for those questions. And that is an important point that, that the availability of pharmaceuticals varies from country to country and, and with shortages that occur also. Uh, and, and yes, I would uh, agree certainly that trazodone is great when it works, but it doesn't always work. So one of the things that we need to do in preparing for these cases whenever possible, and certainly with these more challenging patients that we know are coming into the hospital, maybe, maybe you have Fluffy coming in. Uh, that, that uh, long-haired orange tabby cat, and I have one of those that's literally a terror, and personnel in my hospital couldn't get him out of the carrier at first before we developed the fear-free uh, principles. Uh, so you have those animals scheduled to come in, and we notice people taking the day off to even avoid working with. Uh, one of the things we would like to do, if, as we can, is to try the different pre-visit pharmaceuticals, have the client try those at home, to, to, to then find
find out what works well for them and what might work well for us also. It may be other psychopharmaceuticals. It may be things like Clomacom. It may be uh, uh, other medications. Uh, it may be a combination of trazodone and gabapentin, as I mentioned earlier. It may be extra label use of some cilio or extra label use of a similar product, the oral gel for horses. It's called Dormosedan. That's been popularized through publications from Meg Gruen at NC State and then discussed on VIN also as an, as an option to use in dogs, the, the Dormosedan gel product for horses. So there are many options out there. One of the best things that we can do is try in advance. You know, when we have time, when we, sometimes we don't have time and, and those animals present, we have an emergency situation, we haven't had the opportunity to use pre-visit pharmaceuticals, and the animal hasn't been uh, managed in a fear-free uh, uh, protocol previously. So then we have some of these injectable techniques that's, that's uh, rely still on things, uh, on agents like telazole, or it may be combinations. We don't have telazole available in our country. It may be a, a ketamine plus a midazolam uh, if we have that available. Uh, there are some areas that have uh, uh, alfaxalone available as an IM option. It it's, requires a fair volume, so we need to combine it with some other things. So we get increased synergistic action by combining it with other classes of drugs, like a small amount of ketamine or a small amount of butorphanol, if you will, or other opioids as they may be available. But these psychopharmaceutical agents and anxiolytic agents can often just take the edge off, and it may be a combination of them that's going to work best. And I do encourage you, when possible, to give it a try in advance, work with those clients to find something that reduces their stress as well as the animal stress, you'll be far more likely to uh, win that client as a, as a um, uh, member of your team and somebody that's going to be tightly bonded to and appreciate your hospital because you found something that inc increases the, the chance of success for their challenging animal and it precludes or prevents the rodeo scene that you saw in that cartoon of wrestling with an animal with potential for injury to everyone and certainly exacerbation of fear. Hope that addressed that, that question. That was great, thank you. Um, another question, and this is one that I know is very near and dear to all of us at Fear Free, um, is uh, one attendee mentioned that the course materials stress that restraint should be manual, then mechanical, and then chemical only as a last resort. And the question is, is the use of chemical stress reduction recommended only for pets with known vet fears, or would you recommend it at the first sign of any issues? Uh, there are many favorite phrases we have in Fear Free, and one of them that, that runs a little bit counter to that, depends on how you interpret it, is sedation without hesitation. Okay? And this concept of pre-visit pharmaceuticals. Um, not all animals will need that. Not all animals need sedation. Uh, my my uh, dear friend and trusted colleague, uh, former president of IVAPM, Dr. Mike Petty, has a favorite phrase, and he's a member of our Fear Free group also. Dr. Petty says, hugs, not drugs. So that, <laughs> I think that's a wonderful phrase also, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a principle of training of their animals. And I've seen one of our leaders in the Fear Free movement, uh, Dr. Bloom in Toronto, uh, emphasize the, the gentle handling and the reward system with time with small treats for animals. How you can really turn a terrified animal into one that's not so stressed and fearful of the veterinary hospital. And that video is available on the Fear Free website. Uh, look for Dr. Jonathan Bloom taking care of, of his uh, German Shepherd patient that was previously fearful in a fashion that really relies on, on uh, gentle handling techniques and reward system uh, with small amounts of treats. So it all has a place. What I have done tonight is to emphasize the management of animals um, where that hasn't been enough of a success, or we need to jump forward in order to take care of a patient, or we may have more challenging situations. So I don't want to suggest that this is the only strategy. Please keep in mind that this is for some of the most challenging of our patients, those that we might have said before, extremely aggressive. Now we would say more they're very anxious or very fearful, and that's leading to conflict aggression. And we want to preclude that conflict aggression and avoid escalating it. So one of the ways we can avoid escalation 
is by intervening early. And I know my colleague, Dr. Grubb, when she was doing the podcast with Dr. Campbell, emphasized avoiding the escalation of that stress by getting on board earlier with the medications instead of later. So we all have to use our best medical judgment in deciding how to approach each of these patients. Um, that's a wonderful lead-in for another question that we had, which is, do you have a recommendation for how to handle a situation with a pet uh, who gets out of control if the fear has already been triggered? Yes, and thank you for that question. Uh, something that's hard for us to keep in mind and sometimes hard to do is to know when to quit. Know when to say enough's enough and any more would be too much. We get caught up in the heat of the moment and we feel like we must win. And sometimes pushing things too far can lead to disaster. So quite often if we have a client or a patient really that's very stressed, it's really worked up uh, and it is a situation that would perhaps be better managed another day, another time, another approach, it may be the best solution to suggest to that client a separate visit. It may be time to say, this is not going well. We've gotten off to a bad start. Maybe there was a, some trigger that we didn't anticipate. Maybe that animal saw another, um, uh, another source of conflict. Something didn't work well. Maybe the medication that we planned uh, didn't have the desired effect, and we can't move forward in the fashion that we intended to. So quite often, I'll tell a client in that situation, things are not going well, you know, I, I think it might be best for us to try another day and we will try our best to accommodate your schedule, make it convenient for you. Would that be all right with you? Do you agree? Because we've got to work together on this. It's all about informed consent. And we're not going to do anything that's contrary to the wishes of our clients. But, mm -hmm. but quite often our clients will very much appreciate that because they don't want us to move into that rodeo scene with that animal that was uh, shown in the cartoon. I'm just going to back up to leave it on that slide. We don't want to move into this situation where we have that wrestling match going on because we know that no one's going to win. So I think the, the better part of uh, our decision process here is, is to just stop. Um, you'll be glad to know that a number of people in the chat also made the same suggestion. So your message is getting out there. That's great. Um, I, uh, we also had a question, um, what sedatives would you suggest to spray orally in cats? Oh, okay. The, my favorite choice of a sedative, powerful restraint combination to spray orally in cats is the classic combination that many people call kitty magic. And we'll just postulate a hypothetical average cat that weighs five kilograms. And that used to be a large cat, but I think it's average these days. So we have a five kilogram cat. And I would uh, think the usual injectable dose that we would inject intramuscular in those cats for the usual popular cocktail that many people call kitty magic might be one tenth of a cc each of uh, ketamine, dextomator, and torbegesic. That's one tenth of a cc of each. And those are synergistically interacting together. Uh, so that dose, if you, if you do the math on it, it works out to only be 2 milligrams per kilogram on the ketamine and 0.2 milligrams per kilogram on the butorphanol and 10 micrograms per kilogram on the uh, dexmedetomidine or dexdomator. That might sound high until you realize that the FDA approved dose of dexmedetomidine, dexdomator in cats is actually 40 micrograms per kilogram. So we're using an extra label in a much lower dose. Now those are the intramuscular injections that we would typically use for the average cat. So if we consider something we're going to give by oral spray, really an oral transmucosal, if you will, spray into the mouth of a frightened, stressed, hissing cat, we're going to increase that to either two tenths or three tenths of a cc of each one of those in a syringe, preferably with a lure lock. Uh, connection with a needle on it or an open-end Tomcat catheter. So we can use that syringe and Tomcat catheter or syringe and needle like a water gun. And as that animal is hissing and spitting at us from the back of its airline carrier or the back of a cage, we can spray that mixture into his mouth. Certainly the cat will turn his head. We might miss with some of that in our water gun approach to spray pharmaceuticals in his mouth. 
He may swallow some of it so we don't get oral transmucosal. He may spit out some of it. But typically, the amount that we have for oral transmucosal is sufficient so that that cat transitions within about 15 minutes to one that is restrained, is perhaps crouching. Then we can carefully separate that airline carrier, carefully reach into that cage, drop that feel away spray towel on top of the cat, and then gently and quickly make a supplemental IM injection if needed of more drug, of more cocktail. So we titrate to effect based on the results that we achieved after about 15 to 20 to 25 minutes with that spray medication into the mouth. So it's a, a bit of an art, if you will. That's part of the uh, subtle science of exact art of potions again, where we use that combination <laughs> of synergistically interacting agents. And that is my favorite, the spray in the mouth of a cat. It's certainly extra label, but it works very well. I've done it many times. And if we have the animal in the back of an airline carrier, as I mentioned earlier, we have also the option of throwing in additional towels, not just that feel away sprayed towel, but a handful of towels or a couple of cage pads. And then that airline carrier becomes a gentle squeeze cage, if you will. So we can go around to the ventilation holes in the rear of that airline carrier and inject that animal uh, perhaps in the apaxial muscles as it's gently squeezed in that cage. But if the cat's in the back of a, a cage in our hospital or is hissing and spitting at us and we can't uh, use a gentle squeeze technique, I've used that type of cocktail sprayed into the mouth on many, many cats and found it to be quite, quite successful. Would you, uh, we had a follow-up question, would you use DKT oral if worried about HCM in the cat? I would not. So the question, would I okay. use that in the, in the face of possible hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? And it, it's, it's hard to know which patients have undiagnosed subclinical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It hides, and it's a result of uh, many anesthetic problems with cats. Uh, we can follow the progression of heart failure with things like the uh, N-terminal pro-BNP levels being changed and elevated <laughs> over a period of time. Um, but we, we're not going to have a... We're not going to have an echocardiogram on every animal that comes in. In many of these cats, we're not going to be able to do any auscultation. So I am concerned about that. If there's anything that's going to increase my concern, my fear level, my apprehension with regard to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, then it might be a, perhaps an older male, coon, uh, a male Maine Coon cat. Or we recognize there's some uh, uh, tendency to overexpression of that disease in, in, in that select population. Uh, so if, if I have a higher level of suspicion, I'll leave the ketamine out of that technique. And I may rely more on things like the gabapentin, which hopefully I would have had in, in both cats. Um, uh, and the opioid, the mainstay of cardiac anesthesia really is the opioid. But those are, those are unique cases that I would leave out the ketamine on those, uh, those particular patients. So here's another um, uh, contraindication question, which is what is a good option for dysphoric patients when dexamethotomidine is contraindicated for them? Well, that, that is a good question. I'll have to um, preface my remarks by saying that it is extra label to use dexamethotomidine in patients that are not healthy. Um, in fact, the, uh, one of my favorite phrases, I used it earlier, that the key to success is patient selection came from the development in the initial literature that was released when Domator, the predecessor drug, came out before Dexdomator came out. And the key to success being patient selection and, and the FDA approval, really, the, the licensed application for dexmedetomidine or Dexdomator is for uh, healthy animals. Indeed, it's listed for healthy and exercise tolerant animals. So I'm speaking extra label when I talk about reduced doses to relieve stress and in fact, in many of our high-risk patients. And, and I'll, I'll mention from our one medicine concept with regard to human medications, uh, Presidex is used, the, that's the human formulation of dexmedetomidine, very similar to our dexmedetomidine or dexdomator 0.1, lower concentration, still dexmedetomidine. And in human patients, it's uh, the, their formulation, Presidex, is FDA approved initially for the sedation of humans that are maintained on a ventilator, but uh, started to be used extra label for high risk patients to reduce the maladaptive stress response. And again, in low doses, like a 0 0.5 to one microgram per kilogram, it's what we use in our dogs to reduce the stress during recovery. 
And in fact, we have used it in many higher risk uh, patients in which we would uh, consider the higher doses of dextomator to classically be considered uh, uh, contraindicated. So we're increasingly using dexmedetomidine in lower doses in a broader selection of patients. Um, I would mention that it is extra label again. We would avoid using it in dogs with a heart murmur with underlying heart disease. They may not be served well with the lowered heart rate uh, that we see with the alpha-2 agonists. And again, the mainstay of cardiac anesthesia is reliance on the opioids. We're not going to get a lot of sedation with the opioids alone in these dogs. Uh, those that have serious um, heart disease uh, often will rely on the opioids and perhaps a uh, uh, benzodiazepine also, and that combination synergistically interactive. For the canine patients that have underlying heart disease, um, if they have mitral and tricuspid insufficiency and endocardiosis, we may be able to use a little bit of ketamine or even a little bit of telazole in those to complement the opioids. But now we're talking about a combination of comorbidities of uh, conflict aggression and significant underlying heart disease. And quite often the heart disease make those animals very much more susceptible to sedation from just their opioids. So when we have a patient like that, I suggest a consult with an anesthesiologist. Uh, there are many of us out there that are available to you. You find your favorite one um, online or through the American College of Veterinary Anesthesia and Analgesia. Um, consult the manufacturers, if you will. Call our sponsors today, your local, your experts at Zoetis, uh, to get some recommendations for specific patients. And I can't prescribe for specific patients. Uh, certainly, I don't have the uh, patient uh, relationship. I can only give you some more blanket recommendations. And when we're talking about patients like those that have significant underlying comorbidities that are creating a challenge to handle those patients. You may need an individual consultation. Well, this was amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Harvey. Um, we really appreciate everything that you've uh, brought to us tonight. It was fascinating and helpful, I think, to everyone. You're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat. I'll make sure you see that. Uh, that transcript and, and then you'll uh, that will make your retirement even sweeter and <laughs> maybe one day you'll actually retire. Um, oh, I hope not. I hope not, <laughs> I hope not too. Selfishly I hope not but um, I, uh, so I refer our, our participants also to the Fear Free module 7A and 7B that's 7A and 7B for more information on sedation and the algorithms is also available from Fear Free. Um, we just want to thank you and also thank Zoetis again for supporting this event tonight. Um, we're very grateful to them for that and also for their ongoing support and sponsorship of Fear Free. Um, we hope to see all of you again at one of our other webinars. You can find those listed as well as the archived versions of past webinars. This one will be there in a few days at fearfreepets.com slash webinars. And uh, additionally, if you are looking to get CE, uh, if you live in an area where that race CE is available to you, I posted the uh, URL into the chat window. You can click on it and you will also be taken there as soon as we end this presentation. So uh, we are um, shutting this down now, so you'll hopefully be able to apply for CE. Thank you everyone for being here and again, thank you Dr. Harvey.